Hey everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started if you want to take your seats. Thank you for coming. We're really excited to have everyone here tonight to talk about the American Rescue Plan and how the city of Pontiac can use these funds to better our community. We're going to start this evening off by having Mayor Deirdre Waterman uh, give a brief overview of ARP funding and introduce our panelists. Mayor? A series of town halls that we're having a second in a series of live town halls about something that I think has excited a lot of attention in our city, and that is the American Rescue Plan dollars that have come here and they're a part of the COVID-19 relief package that was passed by Congress. So this is a real opportunity for the city and it's our obligation uh, and our responsibility and our challenge as well as a great opportunity for city to set forth a plan to utilize these dollars in a way that can have a lasting impact as well as in a way that they can do great good for the city of Pontiac. So first, I'd like to recognize the fact that some of you are here from different districts. And uh, let's give a shout out, and I'm glad so many of you have come. So how many are here from District 3? All right, we got some from District 3. Thank you for coming. Uh, district 4, Woo! mighty District 4 are high here in numbers. And you are here with your councilman, uh, Councilman Randy Carter. Would you like to stand and be recognized? All right. Good. And then we also have uh, people here from District 6. Who's here from District 6? There you are. Thank you for coming. District 6, okay. You've got fair representation here. So. Um, if there are any other candidates, you know, this is election time, so I do want to recognize any candidates who are running for office who would like to be recognized at this time. I know that uh, we did have the first live uh, town hall at this for districts one and two, and there we had uh, so many candidates. We had both mayoral candidates and uh, all the candidates from the districts as well as school board candidates, so they are around because they need to make their faces known and see them, and we'd like to see what they have to say about how we use this money, because this is the plan that many cities already have in place, but we need to uh, help our city council come up with a plan for the use of this money. Uh, this money was originally awarded uh, back in February of 2020, I'm sorry, of 2021, this year. Uh, and we actually received the money, at least half of it, in June. So it's been sitting in our treasury since June. And one of the things that a lot of people are asking is, well, a lot of people need this money now. It's supposed to be used for post-COVID relief the way con Congress intended it. So why isn't there a plan now to give some of the relief that people need, that businesses need to get back uh, in place since COVID? The pandemic caused a lot of distress for all of us in one way or the other. Uh, whether it was just getting our vaccinations or whether we were ill from it or knew somebody that we had nursed back to health or another way it affected our business or our livelihoods. So we're happy that uh, this money that originally was supposed to be only $5.8 million, but when I realized when it was first announced that this was much less than cities of our size were getting, uh, I reacted to that right away and I reached out to our, both our federal senators, Senator Stabenow and Peters, as well as to our state legislatures and our congresswoman, Brenda Lawrence, and I said, Pontiac is being treated unjustly. $5.8 million is much less than the cities our size are getting throughout Michigan. What are we gonna do to right this? And by working through them, they went to the uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, and cities in our situation, there were some others in cities, like six others in Michigan who were similarly affected. Uh, the mayors were asked to sign a letter proclaiming our city as a metropolitan city for one year in order to be able to have our allotment increase. So as a result of that vigilance and fighting to get that money, instead of getting 5.8, we are getting, read aloud on your flyer, 
$37.7 million. All right. So we can do a lot more transformation with 37.7, don't you think, than 5.8. Now, as you've heard me say, um, there has to be a plan for spending this money because the federal government, as you know, doesn't just hand out the money. There's a lot of eligibility requirements for that. And so that's what we've come to talk to you about today. What are the eligibility requirements? But also, to me, this is one-time money. This is money that belongs to the city, and by belonging to the city, it belongs to you and me and everyone here who is a taxpayer, a resident, a stakeholder in any way of the city. And I think each one of you should have a right to say and to have some input or to hear how this money should be sent. Do you agree with me? I agree with you because that's what I want to see. So uh, I set about working with our staff to make sure that we let every citizen know that they had an opportunity to find out about this money and to give their input uh, and their engagement about how it should be spent so we should have a plan. Now it's true, although it's sitting in our treasury, at least half of it, uh, we have to account for this, uh, we have to spend it in the right way. But by two years, we have to have incurred this money, which means that we have to have a plan uh, that's underway to spend it. And as you know, some things take a while to really work out. Some things we can do right away. We just have to have the intentionality to do it right away. Uh, and some of those things we've already suggested, such as setting aside some money for people who need uh, grants to, for home repairs and renovations. You know, winter's coming on, and a lot of people who have not had money to do their roofs or uh, other kinds of repairs. That's what people need right now. A lot of people are just getting back to work or businesses that are just getting other doors back open again. They could use a revolving loan fund right now. So that's one of the things that, uh, as you as advocates for this money, can have an input and engagement about this. And we want to take all this information back to city council, which right now hasn't uh, done a plan. In fact, uh, some of them are thinking, well, maybe we're done, and we'll just let them figure it out two months from now or three months from now. And uh, what I'm hearing as we go around and have these town halls is that people say, hey, look, don't sit on this money. We can use it. There are things that this money was intended for post-COVID relief. So let's talk about that. So we want to hear from you. Uh, your council members want to hear from you about what we should be doing with this money for the long term. So with that, um, we had uh, a series of town halls, as I said, and we're going to introduce some speakers first who are going to give you some information about this American Rescue Plan dollars. And one of the things we have prepared for you is that information sheet. Uh, I'm trying to see one, uh, Alexandra, that is, no, the blue one. So you should have received a program for this evening that looks like this. Hope everybody has one of those. And then you also should have received the fact sheet in which, thank you, should have received something like this. And what this is is a summary of what the American Rescue Plan dollars are about. And um, the uh, act itself that was passed by Congress, Congress can't do anything in a few words. You know, they got to do something. So the actual act is probably a couple thousand pages, right, Matt? So uh, we had to distill a couple thousand pages down into a front and back to give you a summary of what this is actually about and how the dollars should be spent. So we made this handy for you to help your discussion. We hope this will be interactive. We hope this will be informative. And we want to hear from you. And uh, Alexandra, who has designed this very helpful way for you to express your opinions and your ideas, will explain that process later after we have a chance to hear from some of the speakers who prepare, prepare, prepare to talk to you this evening. So I'm going to get right to it. I do want to, uh, as we get into this, there's a lot going on in the city in addition to these town halls. And I just wanted to share some of that information with you before we get into the heart of this, before we forget for later on. But uh, there's a number of events going on, of course, that we have set up for the city. One of the things that I'm very proud of is that uh, we have started a youth recreation and enrichment center for our youth. Uh, it's been going on. Uh, it was shut down for a while during COVID, but it's on Golf Drive. And one of the activities that I traditionally have had for the youth, they love basketball. So we're having what's called a jam session. This is about the fourth year we've had that. Uh, that is going to be this Sunday. So if you know any youth who likes basketball, and everybody in Pontiac uh, likes basketball, uh, <laughs> under the age of 18, I think. So we're having this, and it's going to be at the brand new uh, United Household Mortgage um, basketball courts uh, this Sunday from 4 to 7.30. So we have some 
uh, flyers around for anybody who's interested in that. Now that's Sunday, this coming Sunday. Friday, and this is late breaking news, I just found this out this morning. Uh, yeah, Dwayne, we just got the call that uh, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist will be in town on Monday as part of his uh, Thriving Cities Tour, and most likely, uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer will be accompanying him. Uh, they're doing this tour, talking about thriving cities and recognizing cities that have been in the, in the path of progress, and they're going to be here at the Bowen Center, your sister center on uh, Bagley Drive, from 11 to 1 uh, Monday. So we were just told today, so we're just sending out an invite for those of you who want to greet the governor and see what she has to say about how she's working uh, for thriving cities and what's up on the horizon with uh, the American Rescue Plan dollars that they have, and the state has $10 billion that we want to get a share of. So that's Monday. And Tuesday, many of you know we've been meeting uh, for council meetings at the Bowen Center uh, because of COVID, uh, you know, some of our uh, people who meet in the uh, council chambers at City Hall have been slow to get back. Well, Tuesday, we're getting <laughs> some of the changes made and we will be back in the council chambers this Tuesday, October 26th, for our city council meeting. So anybody who comes to the council meetings or has uh, listening to them, uh, we'll be back this Tuesday. So we'll be, uh, be resuming that for city council meeting. Uh, and then the last thing I wanna tell you about is uh, on the 29th, which is a week from Friday tomorrow, uh, you know, we have a uh, grace to have two senior centers, and I'm so proud of the activities that our senior specialists bring uh, for our seniors to make them the quality of life. I'm gonna have Dwayne Lyonstein, who is the manager of the senior specialist, and you do have some of your other senior specialist staff here, uh, who I see they may be up in the back helping, but uh, they are the ones who provide a lot of the activities for our seniors, and I see some of the Lama Sad people here uh, who come to Ruth Peterson. And this uh, coming Friday the 29th, not tomorrow, but a week, uh, they are having a luau complete with uh, ladies and grass skirts and all that sort of thing. And that is going to be at uh, the Bowen Center uh, from 4.30 to 7.30, Friday, October the 29th, uh, at the Bowen Center on Valley Street. So uh, it's gonna be, I guess, some Hawaiian food and some uh, tiki lights and uh, whatever they like in Hawaii. And so it's gonna be a lot of fun. All seniors are invited to that. So those are just some of the things that are going on. I thank all my staff who are continuing to work every day to provide for the citizens of Pontiac. And there are some here who are for the panel. There's some of our staff who's out there in the audience. I want you to stand very quickly so I can see and thank my amazing staff for all the work they do. Stand quickly, please. Um, City Hall staff, administrative staff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, you too, Frank. <laughs> Even though you're behind the camera often. Do stand. All right, thank you. And with that, we're gonna get right to the program that you heard too. Once again, uh, enjoy the afternoon. We want to hear from all of you. Uh, we're glad for the inter interaction and engagement. And at this point, oh, there's my senior specialist, Gladys, Linda, I don't know where Nathan is. Okay, but thank you for, all right. So, uh, Somebody told me you were coming in a grass skirt for the luau party. Is that true or that not fact? No. <laughs> All right, maybe that was a rumor. Any rate, let's move on. Let's move on. Okay, Alexandra, would you please carry on from here? Thank you. So what we've designed today is a, a series of panelists and presentations on five key areas, uh, restoring neighborhoods and citizen relief, business development, and job creation, infrastructure improvements, public safety, and smart city initiatives. Once we finish hearing from the panelists, I will read some questions that everyone has submitted to me. If you have a white card in your hand, you're welcome to bring it up and I'll add it to my stack. I'll pose those questions to the appropriate panelists and we can have a question and answer session. Following our question and answer, we're gonna have an interactive activity where all of us will stand up and go to various stations that are titled um, those five categories that I just read. Um, you'll be able to interact with a staff member from City Hall, 
um, on a specific, specific topic and use the sticky notes to place your ideas onto the table so that we can share those. Uh, following that activity, we'll all come back together and lift up key themes and have a discussion about ways that we can use the ARP funds to better our community. So um, I hope everyone enjoys these activities. I look forward to hearing from you and, and hearing some of your ideas. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with our first panelist, who is Darren Carrington. Um, he's the finance director at the City Hall, and he's going to talk about some of the particulars and permissible uses for ARP funds. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out. Uh, this is a pretty exciting time for City of Pontiac. You know, we not only have um, a pretty uh, sizable opportunity funding that's come down, but it's, it's also an opportunity where citizens uh, get the ability to really weigh in um, in terms of the decisions that are going to be made as it relates to this funding, not only for the mayor, but for all the decision makers uh, that are involved. So I again want to thank everyone for their participation this evening. Um, I wanted to take the time uh, that I have very briefly, just to go over some of the basic parameters with the funding. Um, as was mentioned earlier, this was a federal program that was passed earlier this year. Uh, there were several um, billion dollars that was uh, set aside for local uh, government funding, uh, and that's where the city of Pontiac received its allotment. We received a uh, initial allocation, as the mayor alluded to, of just under six million dollars, and we. Uh, we're very fortunate through um, some communications with key decision makers to get a uh, increase in that allotment where we ended up at, at $37.7 million, nearly $38 million. We received the first half of that money from the federal government in June. That money currently resides in the city's coffers, um, awaiting the uh, input and decision making from uh, folks like yourselves and ultimately uh, from the administration and council to, to appropriate those funds. Uh, but we do have that money, uh, or at least half of the money has already been received. Um, <clears throat> and we expect to get the second half of the uh, $37.7 million. We expect to get another $18.8 million next June. So the funding is here. Uh, it's available. We, we'll be getting some additional funding in, in uh, probably, probably about eight months now. In terms of the program, it's uh, the specific purpose of the program is really to address some of the negative effects of the coronavirus pandemic, specifically the health and economic um, negative things that have arisen out of that. So that's kind of the foundation of when you look at what are some of the allowable uses or what are some of the desired purposes. They initially come out of that, um, you know, either things that were created by COVID in terms of a negative impact or things that COVID kind of exposed, problems that were there that really got uh, further exposed due to the pandemic. And so we look at uh, kind of five allowable uses, one of which is to deal with the health um, and welfare. Uh, that could be anything from, you know, COVID vaccine-based pro programs to testing to uh, health education. Um, you know, the thing to keep in mind is that this program was designed with not a lot of specificity in terms of how the money can be used. We have some broad principles, but we do have a, a fair amount of flexibility in how we choose to utilize these, these funds and how we choose to put these dollars to work. Um, the second, so first area would be the health and welfare. The second area deals with economics. Um, and, and negative economic impact, and I'm sure we're going to be hearing more specifics in terms of suggestions of how that can be used. But that could be, you know, things such as job training, um, a business loan program, entrepreneurship funding, uh, loan guarantees, credit guarantees, uh, homeowner assistance. There, there's a wide array of programs that uh, can and could be utilized under this uh, particular area. There are, there are two uh, areas that are more central to government operations, uh, one of which is um, replacement of lost revenue. Uh, one of the aspects of the program is that it allows local governments to replace any lost revenue that was, was done. That's more of an internal thing um, in, in terms of, you know, how we determine and where we determine that the city may have lost revenue and utilizing these, these funds for that purpose. Um, and then the last area that I want to touch upon is, uh, in terms of an allowable use, is, is infrastructure. 
and we uh, talk about uh, both hard infrastructure, roads are specifically excluded. Uh, primarily, we're, when we talk about hard infrastructure, we're talking about water and sewer infrastructure, um, but that could be tied to a road project. And then we also, up under that category, um, we're looking at uh, kind of, you know, your broadband, your Wi-Fi type of uh, infrastructure, so your information um, infrastructure. And so those are kind of the key areas, the key components. The thing uh, I really want to emphasize is that there is a lot of flexibility. Uh, the government did not really dictate, you know, a set list of uses that we could uh, be limited, that we would be limited to. Instead, we have some broad parameters, some broad goals that the program uh, is pushing, and we our challenge is to design something that really fits the needs of the needs of the, the residents here in this community, and leveraging these dollars as best as we possibly can to go forward. So. And um, as you finish your presentation, uh, would you describe how the eligible uses? fit in with the five strategic areas mm -hmm. that the city has decided are priority concerns for the city? Sure. Um, and I know we, we've um, talked about public safety, and I don't have the entire list in front of me. Um, public safety. Um, and so when we, when we look at public safety, that I, I've got it right here. Um, when we talk about public safety, we get into the, um, you know, areas of, of making sure from a health and, and both an economic standpoint um, because, you know, crime can impact uh, both the public health, it can be a public health, public emergency, as well as it can present certain challenges for a city uh, from an economic standpoint. So that's one of the, the particular areas that, um, you know, to date we've, we've identified as a priority for the city and we've heard from residents as being one of the key components um, in terms of what uh, residents uh, determined as a priority. Uh, another item is smart city initiatives. Uh, that gets into uh, a wired uh, Wi-Fi infrastructure where the city has uh, available Wi-Fi across the entire uh, city's geographical area. Um, during the pandemic, we know a lot of kids were forced to study from home where it really emphasized the need to have access to Wi-Fi. Um, sometimes that was a cost uh, there was a barrier due to cost of, of the Wi-Fi, and then sometimes the infrastructure wasn't in place. So when we talk about a smart city initiative, um, this certainly is something that falls under that, um, that area. Uh, another key priority is the restoring neighborhoods. And again, that can be in the form of, of economic-driven uh, programs such as home repairs uh, and the like that clearly fall under this um, particular area. Uh, also could be getting into different types of programs for um, youth and, and seniors and, and the like uh, when we look at ways to, to you know, help bolster uh, activity around the city. And then the last is uh, business development and job creation. And, and again, that gets back to the economic uh, issue in, in terms of some of the things that I mentioned earlier and that we'll be hearing more about when it gets into job training and, and um, providing business uh, assistance, whether it's financial or some type of, um, you know, training and, and, and education and the like. So there's a, a lot of uh, crossover and overlap in, in terms of the way that the city has began to identify and determine the priorities and how they fit with the requirements of the program. Much, Darren. Um, next, we have Donovan Smith, who is a city planner, and he's going to talk to us about um, those five key areas that um, Darren just went through a little bit. Uh, Donovan's going to get into some of the projects that are already underway in the city um, and then look ahead to the future about particular ways and particular dreams we might have for spending some of this ARP funding. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so Donovan Smith, um, so I think this is a great opportunity for us to uh, engage start to develop opportunities or begin to consolidate those goals and objectives that we want to see within our ARP plan. And the objective of the activity and the things that we're going to try to put together are to establish and uh, show ideas that are sustainable, uh, that are long-lasting, and that have uh, impactful, uh, have a great impact on the community and the 
things that we're doing here. Uh, so when we – is that better? All right. Thank you. I'll just move it up a little bit. <coughs> yep. Is that better? So when we, are, when we look at – oh, yeah, that works. When we look at <laughs> public safety improvements, well, we're looking at uh, neighborhood safety, uh, such as police and fire. When we look at uh, park safety – and infrastructure improvements. So these are uh, improvements to our facilities and uh, access into our parks. We look at uh, pedestrian improvements and uh, access to services, and then also how these all come together and impact the quality of life. Um, so what we have uh, here to our left, or what I'll get into in a moment here, is we have uh, or do engage in our community development block grant program. And these are funds uh, allocated to the city for such improvements. So we have uh, three programs uh, that are bundled um, under this program. We have our sidewalk program. So you can see uh, when, you, when I get to these maps here, there are areas of the city across all districts that the city has been working diligently to do sidewalk and road improvements. And you see those around the community. We also have what is called our demolition program. Uh, since 2016 and 17, we've begun uh, demolishing uh, blighted uh, homes that have been in disrepair, fire damaged, um, and we've been able to demolish upwards of roughly 900 homes, uh, about 250 to 300 within these the districts uh, three, four, and six. Um, and then the last component of our uh, block grant program is uh, park improvements, and these are improvements related to uh, playgrounds, uh, play fields, swing sets, uh, repairs to some of our parks, uh, equipment, uh, basketball courts, um, ball fields, tree plantings, things like that. Um, and if you're familiar, we've done improvements here in Oliver Playfield, uh, and we've done some improvements to the play fields and ball courts at Oakland Park. Um, so that kind of summarizes some of the activities we have. Um, and then I'll briefly show you. All right. All right. So to the far left, uh, here we have District 6. Um, and you can see where the orange circles indicate our community development block grant demos. Uh, the blue uh, icons indicate demos for land bank owned property. And the green uh, icons indicate. Uh, our neighborhood stabilization program demolitions. Um, and then you can also see where we have completed our neighborhood empowerment program, uh, which are our park programs or park improvement projects. Um, so we have here District 3, uh, District 4, and District 6 on the end. write the question on the paper that way we can ask them all at once and, and make sure that they get to the right panelists we're also using the questions so we can um, collect them from all of the town halls we're doing and lift up common themes and put together FAQs based on questions that were asked many 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 times That's a, that's a good point. Donovan, would you mind, um, uh, is there something specifically you'd like him to re-explain? Donovan, can you go back to the slide? Land bank. The uh, Oakland County has a land bank, or they have property that they own, that is owned by Oakland County within the city of Pontiac. Uh, those would be properties that were owned by the land bank that were that had homes that were demolished. So it's just the owner, yeah. the land bank is the owner. Let me help you that with that a little bit. So he was taught, what we were trying to show was that we have some ongoing projects and things we've been doing through the administration right along to improve neighborhoods. Some of those things which we can continue because there's ARP money now for them. But the kind of projects he was talking about particularly are, he calls it demolition, I call it a blight task force. This was a sense to remove all these blighted, burned out homes that were bringing our properties down uh, in the city. And we made a determination to get that done. We thought it would take 10 years. We've done it in five. 
So a lot of neighborhoods are better. Property values are going up. We have less arson fires because we've gotten rid of all those rat and boated, boarded up homes that were all over our neighborhood. So that's a blight program. Some of those homes were rehabbed. You know, about 107 of them, we found people who rehabbed them. So that's the blight program he's talking about. But also sidewalks. You know, we have a lot of sidewalks that need repair. During the emergency manager, there were no s money for sidewalks. So we had to set back to do a lot of backup to catch up with our sidewalks. We've been using CDBG money from the federal government. But, you know, uh, in some sense, those can also be used for RIP. So we're just showing the things we've already done in certain areas, but the things that still need to be done. We've done a lot of street repairs, road repairs, and everybody knows there's a lot of roads that still need repaired. That could be one of the things we could do with some of the 37.7 million. Right. Yeah, a lot, lot has been done. You know, we've been doing it right along. That's part of our job, to continue to do it. But a lot more needs to be done. Well, well, this has been done with other money before we had the ARP. This was done with city money, with state money, with every grant we could get. We apply for a lot of grants. So that's how we've gotten some of the repairs done already. But now the ARP money, some people call them Biden bucks, represent a new opportunity. Remember, our budget for the whole year is about $36 million. So when we get $37 million in one slew with this money, that doubles, that doubles our budget. So that's a real opportunity. And it's a one-time money. A lot of cities already have a plan for how they're going to spend that money. Now, we're just a little slower. A lot of cities already have plans. Right. Yeah. The con I mean, all <laughs> yeah. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we're going to we're kind of to get to that. All right. So the city gets money under the American Rescue Plan. The city got money. County got money. County's got money. The state got money. All right. So one of the things we're here to talk about is that as a city, we got 37.7 million. But we can have projects that also leverage the money that this county got. So if we have something, a project that the county also wants to do, we can get some county money to, uh, to leverage and to increase what we have. The state got $10 billion, $10 billion. So we had a state senator at our town hall last Monday and she talked about, well, uh, one of the things the state is interested in is getting rid of the lead lines in cities such as ours in which we've had houses before 1945 that still have lead lines. And we know the danger of that. So the state is interested, the state is interested in taking on that process throughout the state. And if the city is interested in also doing that to help with the, la the homeowners part of it, then the city can use their money attached to the state money and together we can attack this problem. So that's just one idea out of many ideas. I didn't mean to get into back and forth, but I just wanted to make sure we <laughs> at least clear that up, and I hope that has done that. But we do want to move ahead with the other presenters, okay? Sure, so a lot of those questions will also be answered in some of the other panelists' um, uh, presentations. My name is Alex. Alex. Alexandra born Alexandra, She She's new, yeah. she's uh, <laughs> someone I added on to staff, and she is our Grant writer is we're reinstating our grants department. We have a lot of foundations now who have gotten attention to what's going on in Pontiac, and she is uh, applying for those grants uh, for Pontiac Progress. And she announced one today, $90,000 we got from the next foundation for our senior center. So yeah. go on, Alexandra. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move ahead with our program, please, Alexandra. So the next panelist that we have is uh, Peter Gleck. He is a project manager, um, and he's going to talk to us about Pontiac Smart City Initiatives and broadband. So Peter, go ahead. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so um, here today to talk about community uh, wireless broadband as well as Smart City. 
Uh, um, and the trends that are really kind of driving the discussions around that are first and foremost the digital divide. Uh, Darren mentioned it earlier, but the pandemic really exposed um, the fact that a lot of the, our children and students don't have adequate access to, um, to the internet at home. And just because they're back in school doesn't really solve that because uh, nights and weekends, they still don't have access to that as well. So there's a large percentage of the community um, that does not have adequate uh, internet access. The other thing um, driving that as well is um, the, the shift to remote work. So we're seeing a lot of corporations allowing uh, their employees to stay remote and work remote. And by offering that and having citizens be able to do that, um, it, it also helps with uh, job retention and, uh, and growth as well. And then lastly, uh, the Smart City Initiative, uh, which I'll get into in, you know, in a little bit, but that's a huge driver in the fact of depending on a community broadband solution to be in place. So community wireless broadband is, is it's building the city its own uh, private uh, network or Wi-Fi network that's outdoors. And so um, we're able to uh, you know, build a Wi-Fi that's free and that's accessible um, by the citizens. Um, the technologies that we use are very similar to what you may have in your homes today. So outdoor wireless, where you can simply connect your devices. And we can also build a technology that's around um, LTE or 5G, which is very similar to what you get from an, your, um, your cell phone provider. And both of those technologies um, are very, uh, they're proven, they've been, to, uh, we've Im implemented them at many cities across uh, the US and, uh, and there's a lot of benefits to, to doing this as well. So when we talk about smart city, that's a concept that everybody um, you know, can have a different opinion on, but essentially what smart city means is there's a lot of devices throughout the city that are internet or Wi-Fi enabled. And those devices need a network to be able to send all of their data back to the city for data an, uh, analysis and other things of that nature. And if you think all of the, the things around the city, almost anything can be Wi-Fi enabled now, and they have many benefits. So if you think about uh, things like traffic signals, uh, parking meters, uh, but also public safety initiatives. So um, having Wi-Fi for the, uh, the police and the fire to be able to reliably uh, connect to uh, as they move across the city. Um, and then a number of other um, things like smart grid and water meters, those types of things that can not only reduce cost for the city, um, but also be able to expand upon and, and kind of uh, be able to get real-time analysis on the data from all of the, uh, these items. And then public safety, again, as I mentioned, is a really big one. Uh, so things like gunshot detection, uh, video surveillance, um, all of the things that go into the neighborhoods rely on Wi-Fi to be able to, to send those, um, the, the signal from the devices. So um, there is a tremendous amount of economic uh, benefit that goes with um, establishing this for, for a city. Uh, one of the most predominant uh, use cases is the city of Chattanooga. They did a 10-year independent study that showed the economic benefit to the city was over $2.6 billion in growth. A lot of that was around job retention. Um, they, you know, more and more businesses moved into the city because there was, a, a, you know, Wi-Fi across the entire city. Once you become a smart city, you can start uh, going for more grants. They've received over $110 million in, uh, in city grants over the past 10 years. Uh, significant biz uh, growth in, um, I as I mentioned, economically around the smart grid, which is essentially um, your power and your water, being able to have a smarter connection to the city, and then obviously some of the public safety things that I mentioned as well. So uh, my company has been able to uh, do a, a number of these uh, throughout the country, but two um, public reference and use cases that we have done is the city of Tucson in Arizona, and we were able to implement an outdoor wireless solution there. And the real draw for that was on uh, the, the, the students. And so uh, we covered approximately five school districts and over 13,000 uh, kids were able to have access to internet that, that normally did not. And they were also able to provide uh, Wi-Fi access to things like outdoor parks, uh, other neighborhoods, uh, concerts, those types of things, and became an immediate draw uh, into the city with that. 
The second example is uh, the county of Hidalgo in Texas, which is a very poor community, um, uh, and we were able to provide uh, a wireless network that supported over 30,000 students and, and families to be able to connect to internet access where they really had almost no other option uh, and, and uh, you know, really helped benefit the community there. And then lastly, this is just a snapshot of one of the sections of Pontiac. And it shows uh, in, in this example uh, that approximately uh, 25 plus percent of homes uh, are not accessing the internet today. Uh, and uh, you know, again, we looked at a number of different uh, locations throughout the city. And I would say on average, each area that we looked at had a minimum of 20 to 23 percent of its residents that had no uh, internet uh, in the home. And therefore, obviously, the students did ha didn't have any uh, internet in the home. So um, that's it for my presentation. I look forward to questions and, and talking with you all. Related to the smart city, is it OK with you, Alexander? I know we're trying to keep on schedule here so you have a chance. But uh, do we have one more speaker? Why don't we do the one more speaker and then we'll ask questions of all of them. Yeah, I'm glad you are um, you're engaged. Okay. That was a great presentation. Yeah, Thank you. I like that. Great. Our last panelist is attorney Matt Gibb, um, who works on economic development at the city. He's going to talk to us about business development, job creation, and various ways that we can leverage these ARP funds um, in partnership and uh, in coordination with the county and the state. Thanks, Alex. You're doing good. good evening, everyone. It's, uh, gr it's been a great week of weather, I think. A little raindrop here or there, but it's nice if you all come inside. The sun was still out a little bit this evening when we came, so uh, we're grateful for that. So as you get into the idea of being advisors for your community, that's what all of you are. You're champions and you're thought leaders and you're advisors for what is the best approach to how to continue to improve Pontiac, right? So we're hearing all these cool things. We're hearing about smart cities, and I quite frankly don't know everything about a smart city. So I need to ask a lot of questions, too, about what does that really mean? What does it mean to bring Wi-Fi to our kids in our neighborhoods? And uh, you know, how do we best do that? And when you hear about the projects that are community development block grant, you know, I know about that just because I'm an attorney that used to work with the county. I kind of know that. But what I want you all to focus on, and what I've been trying to focus on in advising from an economic development and from a job standpoint and from a business growth standpoint. So I'm always worried about General Motors across the street, but for this money, for the ARP money, I'm not really worried about General Motors. Uh, Williams International that's on Updike Road is about to do a million square foot expansion, and it's an unbelievably great company. I'm not so worried about Williams uh, with, with this money and this funding. And so I want all of us to be thinking about how can we best leverage the money? Meaning, there's gonna be some great ideas. I know the mayor before the, the session's over is gonna be talking about that the county had always used loan programs for home improvement. Some of you might be familiar with the home program. Oh, I can borrow the money from the county and replace my roof or a water heater in my house. And it's a really often laborious process, right? You, there's all these credit requirements, all these things. Well, can we use this money to do really basic needs? Meaning, can we use it as a grant program for people in our community to have immediate needs? And so be thinking about, well, what would those be? I mean, what, what would the needs be? COVID related, is it someone that has really struggled to keep up with their rent and their mortgage and improvements to their home and now winter's coming? Well, maybe we look at a program that says, we need to make sure that roofs don't leak this winter because that creates a bigger problem, right? So think about some immediate needs, but how do we leverage that? How do we really ask the right questions to say, well, who could help us with that? How do we take, say if we took $5 million of this and put it towards that program, who could help us, right? So Senator Baer the other night had a great idea. She's like, well, the state's focus is gonna be to replace lead water pipes, right? We're all familiar with that. We follow the news. We're familiar with Flint. Well, Pontiac's no different. Uh, my community where I live in the village of Lake Orion, we're a 100-year-old plus community. We have lead pipes and we have old houses. So how can we leverage and be asking the right question that says, well, if we're gonna take a portion of this money, how do we make sure that the state helps us too? So if we have $5 million, I'm just having a random number, how do we turn that into $15 million? And so be thinking about that. Are there other questions that we should ask that says if we're gonna replace 
lead water lines, who can help us? It's no different than the program of having people help fix their roof or fix their water here. Well, when it comes to the business community, when I say I'm always worried about GM, but I'm not really worried about GM when it comes to the American Rescue Plan money, what I'm most concerned about in our community is we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small businesses. What's happening to the small business community? What's happening to the restaurant community? Are they really getting the resources that they need? So some of the questions that we would ask wouldn't be, well, has the restaurant been able to pay their rent? That's a very important question, and let's ask it, but let's also ask, well, how do we help that restaurant or that sewing business or that manufacturing business that employs five people in our community or the sign business that's employing eight people in our community? How do we really help them grow? Well, some of the key things are is those businesses have used all of their own money. We heard from one on Monday night. Have used all of their own money just to stay alive. So how could we use this money to say, well, let's help them long term? Well, we could do lots of creative things. We could say, why can't they grow and why are they using their own money? Well, the banks won't give them credit. So a small business in a place like Pontiac or quite frankly where I live in Lake Orion or other places, we can't get access to credit from the banks right now. Things are very, very difficult to get credit. So could we use a portion of this money and create a credit fund? Meaning we'll say to the banks, this business that goes through this vetting process and we know they're ready really to grow and they've survived through the pandemic, well, could we then pledge a portion of this money and say, we'll guarantee that $50,000 loan that they're gonna get from you, Flagstar, and help them with their credit and give them credit. So that's not something that we would ordinarily think of, right? We would think, oh, we got $37 million and we have so much need in the community. But if we were really to think creatively and say, could we create a credit fund for our small business community that they then eliminate the barrier that the banks won't lend them money, and guess what? We don't lose the money. It becomes a credit fund that we can leverage the interest and then continue to grow. On the other side is maybe we create our own loan fund and we create our micro loan fund or a business loan fund where we take five or seven or eight million dollars of this money and you say, well, isn't that the responsibility of the banks? Well, I'll be honest with you, the banks aren't really lending to the small business that's been struggling because they've been using their own money and they go to the bank and the bank says, well, you don't have any money left. Well, yeah, but we survived. And if the city could look at it and say, let's start asking those questions of what what really does our business community need they need access to capital if we give them a one-time give out we've done that so the COVID money that came a year ago the mayor did an unbelievably great job we helped uh, like 90 businesses in our community we gave them some money to get them through well those businesses have gotten through now what are we doing to take them to the next level so I would encourage all of us all of you and all of us to really be thinking about those types of questions like what does the business community need? Or I'll close on this, what does the employee need? So everybody says, well, they need a job, but sometimes they need transportation to that job. And sometimes they need the proper type of clothing for that job or the proper type of steel-toed shoes for that job. And because people have just gotten through the pandemic, how can we best help them? And so maybe we create a fund that's a business fund that allows people to leverage transportation resources and we go to SMART and we go to NOTA and we go to other places and we say we want to pledge a portion of our money if you'll pledge a portion of the money that you're getting to help us build a better program so that Pontiac residents can actually get to that job or Pontiac residents can show up with the proper uniform on and so there's all of these opportunities that we might not think of right away because we'll be thinking short term of we just have to help people but if we think long term and that's great, I guess there's one more, Mary, sorry. We learned today that the schools are getting some of this money too. Not the money that the city's getting, not the money that the county's getting or the state's getting, but our school district is getting some of this money too. So at Monday night, the mayor asked me after I, I, I hosted my little table, which we'll all go to in a minute, well, what's one of the more unique ideas that came out of that? Well, s someone came and said, we need to be teaching financial literacy to our kids. We need to make smart kids about how do you survive the next pandemic? How do you better prepare for that? Well, if our schools are getting a little bit of money, they've got this great pool of students here in Pontiac, we're getting a little bit of money, maybe we think creatively and say we're gonna throw that box away, not be within that box that says it has to go to these immediate needs. Maybe we think about, we partner with the schools to say you put in a little bit of the ARP money, we put in a little bit of the ARP. I bet you, Mayor, the county would throw a little bit of that money in there too if we said we're gonna create a program that really gives our kids an opportunity not only to learn about careers of the future, 
but how to manage your money, how to be financially literate as you go forward. That's all American Rescue Plan eligible because we can make that case that says we're helping our young people understand about financial literacy and health literacy and all of those are eligible dollars that can be spent. And so if we get really creative, we should be asking the question of, well, what does our business community really need? What does that future employee that's a high school student really need? And how do we ask the right questions and say, Senator Bear, you know what, you brought it up, get us the money for the lead pipes. Or let's talk to Executive Coulter and say, you've got all these tremendous workforce programs at the county, how about you help us by putting some of the $10 billion that the county got into a joint program with the city? So my job on the behalf of the mayor and everybody else is to be thinking really creatively of who do we know? But I need you to be asking those questions of, you know what, Matt, are saying these statements, here's what we really need. I heard about this entrepreneur really needs this. And if you say they really need this, our job is to get creative and say, here's how we can pull that off. So uh, I'll be at the blue table in a little bit. You come and bother me with your questions, all right? Thanks so much, Matt. So that concludes our panelist portion of the program. Uh, I do have your questions here. If anyone has these in their hands, you're welcome to bring it up to me and I can add it to my stack here and we can um, start to go through them. Mayor, is it okay if we start asking some questions? Okay, so the first question I have here, um, Mayor, is probably best answered by you. Um, a resident says the city really needs a better homeless shelter, one where the women and men are, uh, have separate facilities or separate areas with medical staff available, mental and physical. Um, and uh, uh, they also need to uh, work to better these establishments and make them available for the residents. Um, is, this, is this an opportunity for ARP funding? Is this type of project that the ARP funds can help support? The eligibility for ARP funding, since you need to tie it to post-COVID-19 relief, that's where it's intended. Uh, but that, as, as Darren Carrington, our finance director, has told you, their, their requirements are kind of flexible. This is a plan written to give you a lot of opportunities. So it's all a matter of how you're written. A lot of these things can be written in terms of health and wellness. So yes, a homeless shelter is based upon health and wellness. Certainly you can write this in, in such a way to do that. And I know that homeless shelter is um, critical for our area particularly. And every winter about this time, uh, I begin to worry, do we have adequate resources because we do have problems with the winter sometimes uh, of finding people who are dislocated or need to be relocated. So yes, that is an ongoing problem. That's something we've addressed, but uh, we're down to one homeless shelter in Pontiac right now. So that very much is weighing heavy on my mind or how we're gonna provide for that during this winter. Bless you. No. Next question that I have uh, is best answered by Peter. Do, do smart cities uh, or do, do smart city initiatives give internet access to all city residents? Uh, great question. Uh, it depends on how um, you know the city chooses to roll it out. So. Th um, in the, in, the, uh, in the Hidalgo County example that I gave, that is open to anybody who has a Wi-Fi device. So, you know, you would have a, a home page that says, you know, welcome to Pontiac Wireless. You click accept and you're on, just like you would be at a Starbucks or anywhere else. So that's certainly one option. Uh, the other option is to provide uh, an in-home type of device to households that, you know, are either deemed, uh, you know, the target or, you know, the, who are, you know, a lot of times for the students or things like that. And then that will provide individual access to the home. So um, both cases are, are being done and, and depending on how the, you know, the community and ultimately if you choose to implement that, um, they can certainly be taken care of like that. Yep. Thank you. There are, I don't know the particular system that you're speaking about. Uh, is this like an internet provider or? Would you like to come up and ask? 
Frank is our um, uh, our system provider, IT system provider for the city of Pontiac. Well, he comes up, Frank Anton. He keeps our system safe and has uh, uh, continued to upgrade our system uh, as uh, more and more systems are going to the cloud, so we don't have to depend upon those servers on site that get attacked by these uh, uh, these cyber attacks so, yeah. uh, more and more. But also, let me add to you, um, one of the things, we do have a system in Pontiac, the cable system, that you're right, it's from 1980 from the 1980s, which is the problem, which is so many of you complain about the quality of the audio and video you get when you watch the cable channels. And um, uh, Council Pro Tem, Randy Carr, knows that right now we have a proposal before the city council that we need to change to fiber optics, right, Phil? Like every other community has so that we can get the quality of uh, audio and visual that we should have because all our equipment is old, you know? And this year, how long did your um, computer last or your you know cell phone so uh, Frank would you go ahead and explain uh, further that question and talk about what we're doing about going to the cloud here in City Hall actually uh, uh, nice uh, thank you mayor uh, we do the Pontiac does have the infrastructure they do there is wires that built since GM built everything so it, it, it is here it's in ground and we are trying to take that use that to utilize it towards the network, which is the smart city. you know, get the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, uh, well, is the current system providing uh, reliable winter internet access from a, from a wireless perspective today, right? Well, that's exactly what we're talking about is plugging into it. This, a, a smart city and an outdoor wireless is plugging into that infrastructure that's already in place. Have you heard of 123Net before? So we have, we have fiber optic infrastructure that's going all through Pontiac. We also have wireless pops right there in Pontiac as well. So we're shooting wireless out to different locations. I've got my, my logo here if you can see it. Not sure if you recognize it. <laughs> um, at 123Net, I work very closely with the CEO of the company. We basically contribute fiber optic lines to the Detroit Community Technology Project. I don't know if you're familiar with the project in, in Detroit, but we donate f fiber optic lines to Detroit. And then the students are trained to connect the fiber optic lines and do their own connectivity within the city. So not only is it providing free internet to the students in Detroit, but it's also training them on a technology level. I can present this to my company if there's someone that I can speak to. I work very closely with the CEO of 123Net, and if this is something, that a project that we can present, I'll be more than happy to do so. Great little shameless plug for 123Net, uh, <laughs> but I'm happy you're contributing to that conversation. Charging is all over, and Pontiac needs to feed into that, so thank you for that input. You're welcome. Technology is, is a struggle in some communities, and I didn't realize that it was a big struggle here in Pontiac. 
but if there's something that I can do to help out. Is there someone's business card I could take or? Thank you so much. Mayor and to perhaps Donovan, um, what public safety measures are in place for the anticipated increase in traffic into the city due to the new medical marijuana laws? And how can we use ARP funding to supplement those costs? So I can start out. Um, public safety is one of the eligible uses of ARP money. Uh, public safety is probably one of the biggest concerns of all of us. Uh, and um, one of the things I deal with daily uh, because people, when they come to a community, want it to be safe. I want to be safe. I want to be able to feel safe in my home and in my neighborhood and as I go out and do daily things, and I know you do too. So uh, many of the projects that we can do to increase public safety uh, and some of them are, as you say, smart city related, uh, increased surveillance, uh, having uh, things that are connected right to uh, sheriff headquarters, um, even the, uh, the uh, uh, instruments that our public safety officers use to keep us safe as they ride around. All those kinds of things can be part of a smart city initiative. So yes, those are eligible uses uh, for public safety. So there's lots of ideas. I know you have some of them. We have some. Uh, and uh, that's what we're here for. So that is uh, one of the things that I can assure you is uh, could be covered with the right plan by ARP funds. So uh, many of you are interested in what happened with medical marijuana that you passed. Uh, it uh, was passed in November 18 of 2008. 2018, uh, and it was a referendum that you passed that said that the interim clerk would, which is Garland Doyle in our city, would review all the applications for medical marijuana. Uh, and right now, that process got stalled because of a problem internally uh, with um, one of the reviewers that he chose. So now we're trying to set that right so it's a fair process for the people who have applied. But the Glenwood process, process was one of the ones that waited and waited to get approved, and uh, so I can't, I'm not part of the business process of that, but uh, we were all waiting to see if they were going to bring in that Hollywood market, and I was waiting as much as you, because that process has been an eyesore, but from what I hear right now, they've been stalled. It took so long to get their application process that I think that they're trying to regroup. So that's what I know. What is it? Yes, no, no. I have appointed the commission. All right. Okay, are we talking specific about medical marijuana? All right, that's the, yeah, at Glenwood. Well, one of the things is, we that Glenwood has been a, a blighted area for so long. And one of the things we'd all like to see if for some economic development be brought to that area so that we can get some businesses and some thriving. We're making them keep it clean, you know, at very least. We don't want it to stay blighted and broken glass and all that. So that's one of the things we're making sure they do. But uh, I, as much as you, would have hoped that that would have been one of the projects that could have been revived. Um, the idea of having a Hollywood market there and having other businesses there was tremendous. But somehow, um, you know, I can't go into the details of uh, what the business aspects of it were, but yeah, I guess they were waiting and waiting and waiting to get their application reviewed, and uh, the clerk never got around to it. So, I hear you. Uh, I'm with you, but we're going to go back to ARP, okay? <laughs> Next so we'll question. take one more question, and then we'll go ahead and head into our uh, breakout activity. Um, the last question I think is best suited for Matt. Um, how do we use ARP funds to make Pontiac a destination city? Well, listen, um, a, a couple of things that you're all saying, and, and uh, the gentleman in the Tennessee sweatshirt, I'm a University of Kentucky grad, so I'm just going to give you a pass tonight. You're a UT guy, I get it. But, you know, if, if you can help us out when we do our breakouts in a minute, 
You know, your question is really important. And the question that we need to be considering as an administration, as a council, and as a city, is your question is, can we leverage the existing infrastructure that we have so much of and how do we do that, right? And so we need you to be asking those questions. The kind lady from the one, two, three company, really asking that question of, you know, how do we utilize ARP to bring companies to Pontiac and, and what role do they have, right? So we need to be asking those questions, right? So it's a really good question and we need you to write it on a little sticky note and we need to, you know, even with Glenwood Plaza, you need to be saying, can we use American Rescue Plan dollars to finish some of the economic development projects, right? You don't have to have the answer, I don't have the answer, but if we ask those types of questions, um, uh, it's really important. So how do we make Pontiac a destination city with American Rescue Plan dollars? We leverage those dollars to support things that make people want to be here and want to invest here. So COVID-related effect. So we have less than 5% vacancy in our mid and lower income housing stock right now in Pontiac. And you say, well, do we need more moderate income housing? We, well, we do. The reason we do is people do want to live here. Well, where do we strategically put those dollars? Do we put them in the downtown area to try to incre increase residential aspect in the downtown? That'd be phenomenal. That's where my office is. Those restaurants are all empty during the week. Let's get some more people down there. So if we think strategically about how we can utilize ARP money to support housing development, because the federal interpretations now have said, well, yeah, you can use ARP money to support housing. Well, that's the question we ask. Should we utilize this to create more housing in our community? Or can we utilize American Rescue Plan money to really look at, at finishing some of the economic development work. So you can use it for infrastructure. So um, who's experienced a flood in the last year? Well, I, all of us have, right? So we can utilize this money to fix drainage infrastructure and sewer infrastructure within our city. Well, how does that make us a destination city? If investors and people that want to come to our city or are here, which we have by the dozens and hundreds, if they see that we're utilizing this in a strategic way that says we're fixing infrastructure where you can make something better. Meaning the city will take on and say, we're identifying where the drains don't work and we're gonna leverage the Water Resource Commission at the county to get even more money out of this and we're gonna fix that drainage that's gonna allow you to improve that house, to enter a rehabilitation agreement, to take over that school building and do a moderate income housing project. When, when investors that are here and abroad see that, then they say, well, that's where I wanna be because the city gets it. They understand that by fixing that and using the dollars to have a broader vision of how that can draw in investment, you become a destination city. And so those are the questions we ask. Yeah, the, here's the challenge, here's the challenge. Yeah, so here, here's, a, here's an interesting challenge with ARP money, we can't use it for streets. Yeah. So we can use it for broadband, uh, which is a really cool idea, and we can use it to fix water lines, which is a great idea because it's a health issue and we can use it to fix storm sewers because it's important because we do have areas of our city that when it rains hard, it floods, right? So we can do those things, but they won't let us fix the streets. So that'll probably come in the next infrastructure bill that they're talking about, but right now we can't fix the streets. Well, it's, you know, we'll have to ask our, our, our senators and our representatives. Okay. You would think so, you would think so. So that's just some of the ideas to think creatively when we say, well, how can we do that? The last thought I'll have this at our, our Monday town hall. Sorry, man, I'm taking up too much time. I apologize. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a, a really good group that is part of the um, automotive museum uh, here. So can you use American Rescue Plan dollars to support something like the automotive heritage of our community? Well, I think we can creatively write these descriptions of what we're doing to invest in those things because it allows people to come here. One of the aspects of Re American Rescue Plan right in the legislation is this is meant where communities have lost tourism, where they've lost commerce. Well, what's more tourism in Pontiac to brag about our history, right? So you can create a destination city by saying, well, could we use some of this to support those ongoing programs? I know they'd love a few dollars to be able to get that museum um, out there and open. And so we just have to be creative, folks. So sorry, I talked a little too long. No, I'm glad you answered that question, Matt, because that's a question that comes up a lot, and I think it's worth answering. I'm glad you asked that, uh, because uh, road repairs, everybody knows we need more road repairs, but this particular act doesn't allow for that, just specifically. So that's a good question. Someone else asked, uh, what is citizen relief? Uh, and citizen relief means, uh, that's one of the big categories, 
uh, anything that uh, people have suffered from, particularly health and wellness from COVID-19 that we can help with. This money can be used for that kind of citizen relief. And with that, Alexandra, uh, as we talk about infrastructure, we already have one of our uh, table sitters, uh, Abdel Siddiqui, who's our city engineer, who's sitting by the infrastructure table. Uh, and this is your chance now to have some interaction and go and tell your ideas about how you would want this money to be spent. And Alexandra will tell you how to do that. I'm going to let Alexandra go right now, OK? Hold on just a minute, uh, to Pro Tim. I can talk to you, but I'm going to let Alexandra help the whole group right now. Hold on, hold on, please. Alexandra? Um, so we've arra strategically arranged tables around the room, different colors with corresponding sticky notes. Each table um, has a particular area assigned to it. Pink is restoring neighborhoods and citizen relief, and you'll find these designations at the bottom of the agenda that you found on your chair when you walked in. Blue is business development and job creation. Green is infrastructure improvements, purple is public safety, and yellow is smart city initiatives. And a staff member will be standing at each of these tables to engage in dialogue with you, to ideate with you, and be creative about building solutions and strategic plan for uh, the use of these ARP dollars. Um, we ask that you take a sticky note and a pen, and you write some of your ideas down and place them on the table, and we'll come back to this group um, in about 15 minutes. So um, that's right at about 7.30. I know we were supposed to end at 7.30, but we're running a little bit behind schedule. So we'll take 15 minutes, and at 7.30, we'll come back to the larger group and lift up one or two of these ideas that come from our breakout sessions. Does anybody have any questions about the logistics of that activity? Um, is that a question about the breakout groups or a personal question? OK, well, we're going we're gonna to break out into the groups now. And then we'll come back to questions after that. So we want to give 15 minutes now, right, Alexandra? So everybody come back in 15 minutes after you go to the breakout tables, all right?
If we could have everyone gather back to their seats, we'd love to share a couple of critical ideas from each of the colored tables. So if you could uh, wrap up your last idea and make your way back to your seat, we'll be able to share some of these cool ideas. our panelists come back up and bring uh, one idea from their table so we can share it with uh, all of the attendees. Okay. Matt, if you want to start since you're here, I read one of the ideas from your table. All right, I can start. So, um, so all of you, I think, are probably thinking a lot of this stuff. So all of these is one idea, but you'll be, well, you, you, you get it one as I go through it. So coming to my blue table about jobs and economic growth, so how do we do a better job of, of attracting livable wage jobs to Pontiac? It's a good point, right? So not only just a job to Pontiac, but one that has the type of wage that could pay somebody that they might own a house and that they would have insurance, right? So with that comes, how do we better do a better job of upskilling our workforce, meaning taking our existing workforce and saying, how do we better introduce them to the types of skills that they could use uh, going forward. And I thought those are really, really good ideas of, of understanding a better sense of what the jobs will be in three and five years. How does Pontiac go after those jobs? How do we leverage some of this ARP money to help us do that? But most importantly for our people, how do we give them the resources? But Mayor, here's the idea that I thought was, was really just spot on. And it's, um, we see it all over the place. We see so many entrepreneurs in Pontiac. We've got food entrepreneurs that do great food and we see them on the street corners. We've got entrepreneurs at the Dixie Market. We've got entrepreneurs everywhere. And someone came to my table and said, we're not training those entrepreneurs how to go from, I can bake the best cake ever. I don't know how to sell it to you. And so it's a really good idea, Mayor, to be thinking about business services around this that we could take a small portion of this money and teach how to turn the inventor and the entrepreneur into the business person. And think if we got 50 of those out of this, we'd have 50 the most unbelievable small businesses in Pike. So I thought that was the best idea of the night. Excellent. Donovan, do you want to share one of the ideas from your table? I do. All right, so in our discussions at the public safety table, uh, there were a lot of comments related to increasing uh, pol police patrol in our neighborhoods and the use of uh, policing in our community. So that was the uh, primary one, yeah. Abdul, would you like to share um, one an idea from your table? Abdul is so popular over there. We got a lot of people who have streets ideas, huh, Abdul?
So we have a uh, sewer infrastructure in the city that hasn't really been inspected and cleaned as a whole uh, since it was installed, you know, so decades and decades ago. So um, part of the use, and this is a very clear-cut use of the funds, is to um, in inspect and clean all that infrastructure. Uh, we're talking about the drains in your streets and then the pipes, uh, the manholes that they connect to, and you know the, the, the larger pipes that they all flow into and out to the, to the lakes and the rivers um, and to the, or to the, you know, or to the wastewater plants. So th that's funds that we would utilize, we're proposing to utilize for um, cleaning and televising, and then, and then if we identify issues, uh, possibly earmark another additional portion of the, of the funds for emergency repairs. And then, you know, f from there we can create more projects for repairs of storm sewers uh, using our, our usual funds as well. And then there's been also, ex excuse me, uh, Councilman, there's also been uh, suggestions for the parks, um, you know, setting aside some funds to upgrade our parks to the standards of surrounding communities as well. So that was a good uh, suggestion as well. So how would you apply that to ARP money? What kind of, what kind of uh, request would you make for ARP money for that particular problem, uh, pro tem? Siddiqui. Okay. So what kind of ARP project could we take, Mr. Siddiqui, to uh, help with a problem like that? So again, Is that you had, I know in one other of our town halls, you suggested that we needed to do our home, uh, repair our whole storm drain system. Is that something right, that that's related to? Right, that's the storm drain system. That's what yeah. I'm talking about, is the storm sewer, storm drain system. Um, as far as the, the location that you're talking about, we're monitoring it on a, on a, nor on a really daily, weekly basis, you know, as when storms happen. Um, we don't see the water rising in the wetlands across uh, across the street there, okay. too too much higher. So, you know, at this point, there's really not much we can do. Point well taken. That's a point that. of history, and certainly now, and I realize in past administrations, they didn't get performance bonds. Every development agreement that I have done since I've been mayor, I've been insisting that we have performance bonds for all our uh, developers so that people don't get stuck with unfinished roads, don't get stuck with uh, bad drainage systems. So uh, under my administration, I can't speak for all the mayors before me, but that's happened while I've been mayor, and I hope whoever follows me will do the same thing. And I will say, when we when we get complaints about flooding, we do go out and investigate those issues. So it's not like we're not doing any um, maintenance or any investigation. We are investigating when we where we get complaints, but at the system as a whole, we need additional funds to invest to clean and. And, in, uh, and video the whole system, you know, in 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 uh, as as uh, in, in its totality. Yeah, pro tem, did you put that down as a suggestion for ARP? So you put the, put it down. As, uh, the answer is yes. Okay, great. Okay, that's a suggestion for ARP funding, and we're right. And uh, Abdul. 
uh, is, uh, has already suggested that. So, so our but last but just some, sorry, just some numbers I want to throw out here. So we have 250 miles of storm yeah various sizes you know some as so tall so so large that people here can walk through you know so and those are all that's old infrastructure that we need to in, need to uh, inspect and upgrade possibly repair possibly you know we don't want a situation yeah. that where one of our roads just you know collapses into a, into a 72 inch uh, yeah. pipe you know so and then we've got 6000 catch basins which is where you know the leaves are clogging but that's the entry point to the system right uh, we could get sweepers that the city owns right now the su city rents sweepers we can get sweepers to sweep those streets we don't sweep locals right now because we only have we only yeah. have the funding and the resourcing resources to sweep major roads Abdul, I know he can get, we can get to the DPW department and they would like a lot more money. So they have something on the agenda next Tuesday, pro Tim, we hope to vote for, to increase the money for engineering services so we can do some of those repairs and some of those street repairs. So I hope that you'll vote yes when that comes before council next Tuesday, okay? All right, so we have one more. Our uh, last area. breakout table was Deputy Mayor Mark Holland. And um, Deputy Mayor, do you have um, a key idea from your table that you'd like to bring and present to the larger group? Uh, yes, actually, uh, we exchanged some numbers. Uh, some of the neighborhood uh, concerns, uh, yes ma'am? Well, no, some of the neighborhood concerns uh, can be handled uh, Friday or, or Monday, but most of it was about blight and how we can control blight and make our neighborhoods nicer. talked about blight uh, earlier today. Um, we're continuing. That's an ongoing problem for communities, but we're happy that we've come so far. Uh, I think uh, Donovan told you, and actually we showed on the map there, how many blighted projects we've undertaken. Uh, when I started as mayor, we had identified uh, over a thousand some blighted properties, some of those who had been there for years, burnout, infested, rat rodent. Uh, and I said, hey, we can't improve our neighborhoods until we got rid of those. So I made an intended effort. We had what we call the Blight Task Force. I'm happy to say that we have completed that project in five years. Uh, we've taken down uh, most of those homes. Some of them have been rehabilitated. Some of them are commercials. And now we're working on commercial structures. So we have about nine of those. And the Batch 17 Council uh, Pro Tem, uh, we have Batch 17, which is the last batch of the Blight Task Force that we set our goals to do. Uh, council approved to do the asbestos removal from that batch 17 before you Tuesday is to do the demolitions. So let's not do the asbestos and leave open for trespassing. Make sure you vote for the demolitions on Tuesday. Okay, that's up to council to make sure that that gets done so we can complete our bright program in Pontiac. That has made our cities, our neighborhoods cleaner, brighter, better, safer, and has improved our property values. For anybody who has property values, you see they were, they were flat for about 10 years. They've gone up to, um, two digits every year for the last three years. And that's because we've taken care of our neighborhoods. All right, any other presentation? So um, anybody have an idea in the, we have one more minute. Uh, so anybody would leave with the last idea to take back to council? All right, you get the, the grand idea at the moment. Yes, Scott. When are they gonna fix this parking lot? Because if I fall, you're gonna be sued. <laughs> this parking lot, when you Wait a minute. Hold on, Abdul. I'm holding your feet to the fire now. Uh, we got the money for this, uh, and CBDVG, and Bo Bowen Center is being done now, and Ruth Peterson is supposed to be done this summer too, this fall. So Abdul, don't go back on me. I'm, the whole, I'm, he's, uh, I'm questioning you right now. What happened to have Ruth Peterson being done this fall? All right, I hear you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold his feet to the fire because I thought it was going to be done this year too, all right? I hear you. Okay. Who? 
Hope is coming. Hope is coming. You want to hear the news? Want to hear the news? All right, Alexander. So the today news. the city uh, was awarded $90,000 from a nonprofit organization called the Next 50 Initiative, and that money is specifically designated for senior center improvements. So um, it's a relationship that we'll be building with that nonprofit um, and various others to begin um, infrastructure improvements for these buildings. So I got. We, we received the award today. So um, as we progress, we just yeah. got the grant today. So give us a minute, okay? I know. I know. We're. I know. We're. I know. We're trying to work quickly. So give us a minute to get it done. But we okay. have every intent on doing that. Excuse Thank me. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. It was great. We thought we had a great presentation. Uh, we hope that we're working to make I a better city. Mayor, I know lots of you have lots of questions, but I'm going to let everybody go. Thank you. Thank you. The next, uh, what?